We turn now to our concluding study in the first letter of John. And if you have followed with us during these last nine months that we've gone through this letter, you would have seen what a tremendous burden there was on the heart of this apostle to communicate to believers again and again repeating and emphasizing in his letter the tests that manifest whether we have eternal life, whether we are born of God, whether we are abiding in Christ or not. He repeats this so often in the space of a few pages, so many times repeating the same thing again and again and again and again. And as we have studied through this letter in detail, verse by verse, you would have seen how much that emphasis comes. Now this was true of all the apostles. For example, if you turn to Second Peter in chapter 1 and verse 12, he says there, Therefore I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right, Peter says, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder. Verse 15, And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you may be able to call these things to mind. Peter and all the apostles knew how brief our memory is. We are taught something and we forget it very quickly. So the apostles knew that, and so they repeated their message. They did not seek honor in their preaching, so that people should think that they're always preaching something new. The people in Athens, we read in Acts 17, were always wanting to hear some new thing. And many Christians are like that. They're always wanting to hear some new thing, and that's why they never make any progress in the Christian life. And there are sufficient preachers in the world who are always ready to preach some new thing to them. But Peter, he said, I'm going to remind you of the same old things that I've told you when I was with you and that I've written to you about before, and I'm going to keep saying the same thing again. What about Paul? We read in Philippians and chapter 3, writing to that church at Philippi where he had been for some time and established a church. He says in Philippians 3.1, to write the same things again is no trouble to me and it's a safeguard for you. This is Paul's attitude also. He says, I'm going to write the same things to you again. I spoke them to you when I was there, and I'm going to write to you again what I wrote to you before. That, what is the way of life? And this is a safeguard for you, Paul says. It's no trouble to me, but it's a safeguard for you. Repetition. And any man who follows in the footsteps of Peter and Paul will have to follow their example here. He says to the Thessalonians too, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 5, Do you not remember that I was, when I was with you, I was telling you these things? He told them these things and he repeated them again in a letter. You read, for example, in John's episode, the one that we have studied, 1 John chapter 2 verse 21. 1 John 2.21, he says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, because you know it. Then why are you writing it, John? So that I might repeat it and emphasize it to people. There's a great need for emphasis on these cardinal truths. And what have we seen in John's letter, as we can quickly go through it, looking through these five chapters with a bird's eye view. He begins with the subject of life, chapter 1. Life is what he's interested in. That life, he says, which we saw manifested to us. The life, that eternal life, an eternal life we saw is the very life of God, which dwelt with the Father from all eternity, 1 John 1, 2, was manifested to us. Manifested that we might receive that life. And he says that life will produce a change in us in two dimensions, vertical and horizontal. It will bring us into fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, and horizontally, it will bring us into fellowship one with another. John's subject is life, the life of God. And he says, we can have it. And this is the message, he says, we've heard from God, 
that God is light. He says two things about God in this letter. God is light, 1 John 1, 5, and God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And God's life is manifested in light and in love. And when we receive that life, it will be manifested through us in light and in love. And light speaks of purity, holiness, and love. These are the two essential characteristics of God's life. It was seen in Jesus Christ, full of grace, love, and truth, that is purity and holiness. And if we say we have fellowship with him, and these two things are not manifested in our life, then we are deceiving ourselves. This is the burden of John's letter. That it's very easy, he says, to say something with our lips which is not true in our life. We can say we have fellowship with him, 1 John 1, 6. We can say that we have no sin, verse 8, then we deceive ourselves. We can say that we have not sinned, and again then we make God a liar, verse 10. We can say, for example, in chapter 2, verse 6, that we abide in him, but if we don't walk as he walked, again, we are deceiving ourselves. 1 John 2, 9, we can say that we are in the light, but if we don't love our brothers, then we deceive ourselves again. And this is an emphasis right through the letter. The confession of your lips by itself is no proof of your having divine nature. It is the character that comes through your life that proves whether you have divine nature or not. Just like Jesus said, it's not a question of saying Lord, Lord with our lips but of manifesting that character through our life. When we realize that John the Apostle is writing this letter at the end of 65 years of walking with God, having established churches in many parts of the Mediterranean, and having observed Christians of various types, deceivers and sincere people, over 65 years, and here is his last letter to the church. Imagine the burden that is on the Apostle's heart. And there are many who feel, tradition seems to tell us, that this is possibly the last letter of inspired scripture. That even the book of Revelation was written before John wrote this first letter. And even second and third John were written before. And if that is true, then this is the last portion of inspired scripture. Just like Malachi was the last portion of inspired scripture before Jesus came to earth. Here is the last portion of inspired scripture and you see there his emphasis is not on evangelism, it is not on gifts of the spirit, it is not on supernatural manifestations. What is the burden of the last inspired scripture written by an apostle? It is holiness of life, obedience to God's commandments loving your fellow believers, laying down your life that other believers may have God's life communicated to them through you. Bearing the cross, in other words, dying to yourself that others might have life. And confessing, this is the foundation for it all, 1 John 4, 2, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that he came with our flesh, and manifested this life in his own human body. And through the Holy Spirit whom he gives to us, we too can manifest that same life of Jesus that was manifested on this earth 1900 years ago. And thus God can be seen through us, not just individually, it must be seen individually, in the one who is born of God, not committing sin, chapter 3, verse 9, in the one who is born of God, practicing righteousness, chapter 229. In the one who is born of God, loving his fellow believers, chapter 4, verse 8. The one who is born of God, overcoming the world, chapter 5, verse 4. But also, in the Christian community, 1 John 4, 12. If we love one another, God dwells in us. This is the burden of the apostle, all these things that I have mentioned. And if we are to follow in the footsteps of the Apostle, this will be the burden of our preaching, those of us who are preachers of the Word, and those of us who are called to follow Jesus. This will be what we seek to emphasize in our life and in the church in which God calls us to fellowship. God grant that it will be so.